Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining me today. Um, my name is Yamala Diaz. I'm a clinical child psychologist here at the NYU Child Study Center. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, we're going to be focusing on talking to your children about racism, a very timely and important topic. Um, before I begin, I just want to mention that um, uh, you can submit questions at any time today by typing them into the questions panel of the control panel. That's the one on the right side of your screen. And we will answer questions at the end of our presentation, and I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. Um, so what we're talking about today is really to focusing on the question, should we talk to children about race and racism? Why, when, and how should we be talking about uh, this topic? Um, and we will address uh, those very important questions, focusing mostly uh, today on how to have these conversations, because I think that's what parents and teachers are really struggling with. Um, this conversation is such an important one, and the issue has been significantly highlighted by the recent tragic and difficult events in Charlottesville. However, I think it's important to note that this, um, this issue is not a new issue, and this is not a quote-unquote current event. While we may have been fortunate to have seen improved race relations over recent history in our country, um, the fact is that racism and discrimination is a very significant component of our history, and it's fairly embedded in our foundation as a country. In fact, during a recent interview I participated in with uh, Dr. Joe Fagan, who's a distinguished professor at Texas A&M uh, and an author of numerous articles and books on race and racism in America, he highlighted the very startling statistic that 83% of our nation's history included slavery and the Jim Crow era. So this is really eye-opening and really highlights that racism and discrimination is really a significant part of our history. So should we talk to children about race and racism? Absolutely. We really can't afford not to. And let me be very clear before we get started that these discussions are relevant to have with all children, not just children of color and not just Caucasian children. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the first question. Why should we talk to children about racism? Well, the first point I want to make is that they notice it from an early age, even when we don't talk about it. In fact, some research suggests that initial awareness of race actually begins as early as four months of age, and that children of color under five years old show evidence of being aware of and negatively impacted by stereotypes about their racial group. So very young children are noticing racial differences, and they are being impacted by the stereotypes and biases that come with, um, uh, that affect different uh, members of different groups. We also know that racial and ethnic socialization among children of color, which is essentially educating them about their racial and ethnic background, is associated with several positive outcomes, including higher self-esteem and higher academic performance. It also provides children with a better understanding and awareness of racial equality and justice. And these are conversations and um, issues that we want children to be aware of early on, because in fact, they are setting the stage for the future of uh, what race and racism in, um, in this country looks like. Children also demonstrate more respect and openness toward people from other racial and ethnic groups when we have these conversations. And lastly, it teaches children to recognize and respond more appropriately to racism and discrimination. So those are just a few reasons why we should be having these conversations. But I often have parents ask, like, what if we just let them figure it out and avoid talking about it altogether? Not such a great idea. The first thing that that communicates is that this is a taboo or unimportant topic, um, and we know that it's not. And it also maintains the very privilege that permits you to avoid the topic, right? So if you are privileged enough not to have to talk about race and racism in America, not talking about it actually maintains and perpetuates that privilege. You'll also miss really important opportunities to shape the way that children think about and understand the world around them. And really, that is your parenting job, if you think about it. Teachers as well. Our whole goal is to shape the way that kids think and what they sort of grow into. And if we stop at race and racism, we're really missing an opportunity to shape the way that they think about these issues moving forward. Also, without information and guidance from parents, teachers, and other adults, kids will still develop biases and stereotypes based on the information they gather from other sources and from their own experiences. So they are learning and growing whether we're talking to them about it or not, and so you don't want to miss the opportunity to um, participate in the way that they are learning and growing from their experiences. And finally, they may purposely or inadvertently kind of align themselves with friends and groups that kind of create sameness. 
that's what uh, one of the things that kids will often gravitate toward is, and this is really true about human beings in general, is that we gravitate toward things that feel the same, that feel similar, that feel familiar. And this further perpetuates racial and ethnic group divisions, right? So we can't just let them figure it out and avoid talking about it. So when should we talk to children about racism is the next question. And a very simple answer to that question is to start at a very early age. A lot of times parents and teachers assume that we don't need to talk to young children about race and racism because um, they don't see color and they, this is a, a really difficult topic to talk about. But we really do want to start at an early age because it does help set the foundation for embracing differences and for understanding what they see and hear as they get older. Again, going back to the point that you don't want to miss the opportunity to shape the way that they are understanding their world. So what do you do uh, to talk to really young children? You want to make the, ma the message age appropriate. A couple of uh, brief tips before we move on to what I really want to focus on, and that's how to have these conversations. For children ages 0 to 5, you can highlight similarities and differences that you see using positive language. Point them out. Use books and TV shows to point out the differences in skin tones and the differences in, um, in, in people, highlighting very positive attributes. And also provide simple messages about being kind to people of all colors. These are messages that kids in this age range can really understand. As they get a little bit older, school-age children, children ages 6 to 11, you can be a little more serious about the topic, and you can begin to introduce the idea that some people get treated unfairly because of skin color, culture, or religion. And this is where you also um, can begin teaching the concept of inclusiveness and fairness, equality, and justice. And certainly for teenagers, you can be a lot more direct and concrete about their own experiences and experiences that they are seeing and witnessing around them. And you want to also make sure that you are monitoring and addressing any inappropriate language or behavior and their social media posts. Oftentimes with teenagers, they might not, they might sort of post or say things that they don't mean like that. But you want to catch those opportunities to help them understand that even if they didn't mean it like that, how whatever you know, it was intended to, to mean that it could still be hurtful to other people. So for teenagers, that's another thing that you can focus on. So let's get to the really important part of this conversation, and that is how do we have these discussions. It's a tough topic to talk about. It's an unfortunate topic to talk about um, in terms of the impact that it has on uh, you know, people from different backgrounds. But we want to have these conversations. So I want to help you have those conversations in the most effective way possible. So let's start with the sort of top tip, and that's to be open for discussion. What does it look like to be open for a discussion? Well, I've already highlighted that sometimes people want to avoid this topic because it feels heavy. But you want to communicate to your kids that you are open to have these conversations, uh, no matter what the conversation looks like. The first thing that you can do to be open for discussion is to validate their questions, comments, and their feelings. And by validating, you can simply say, I understand that you're asking me X. I understand that you're feeling this way. I understand why that made you feel that way. It seems like you have a question about this. You're just validating that they have the question. You can also applaud their efforts to understand different situations. So if your child comes to you with a question about what's happening in Charlottesville or what they saw on the news, um, you know, you can start first by saying, I'm really, you know, I'm really proud of you that you are trying to understand what's happening. Um, that's, so, that's so mature of you to try to understand what's happening to uh, other groups or other people. So applaud those efforts. Also, be very, very careful here to avoid reprimanding them for questions and comments that don't quite come out the way you'd like them to. Kids are curious, and they don't have the language necessarily, depending on how old they are, to appropriately phrase the question. But if you uh, sort of smack them for, um, say, for asking, because they didn't say it in the way that you would have expected or you would have liked, then you will make that conversation even harder to have in the future. So discuss their question first, gently correct their language second. Be open and honest, but try to stay calm. And this is really important because many of us are very charged about this topic. It's really an unfortunate um, sort of series of events that have happened recently, but also just in general. And it's okay if you're angry, emotional, but label that emotion for them so that they understand what your experience is and so that your emotion doesn't make it harder for them to participate in the conversation. 
very importantly, and you can take this tip for every conversation that you have to have with your kids, and that's to teach, don't preach, okay? Engage them in the discussion by asking questions, reflecting what they've said, listening carefully to what they're saying and what they're expressing versus simply talking at them and trying to uh, shove all of your messaging into one conversation. And last but not least, don't get upset if they don't want to talk to you when you want to talk about this particular topic. Just keep the door open for future conversations. Next, use teachable moments. Right? You can use things like books, toys, TV shows, et cetera, to open discussions. Point things out as they're happening and open a conversation. You can ask open-ended questions to say, well, you know, what do you think about what just happened? Or as you're reading the book, why do you think that this happened to, to this character? Engage them in that really enriching conversation so that they can participate with you. Look for opportunities to point out stereotypes that are occurring right before their eyes and use that opportunity to provide a counter message. So if you see a stereotype at play, whether it be in a movie or whether it be in real life, you can actually point that out to them and say, you know, it seems like this is a stereotype. Do you know what a stereotype is? Explain what a stereotype is and how people think broadly about people from different groups and then provide the counter message right in that moment. It will make for very enriching conversations with your kids. Talk about the news and current events. Don't shy away from it. Don't hide it from them. You can engage them in the conversation and talk about what's happening. Help them process and understand what they're seeing. And you can also put it in a historical context. This is where parents sometimes get a little uncomfortable because myself included, we could all stand to go back to our early history classes. And that's okay. Educate yourself about the history if you're not sure how to talk to your kids about this. Talk about your own experiences. This is actually particularly important for parents of color as well to really be able to share and, and to process your own emotional uh, experiences with race and racism um, in this country and share some of that with your kids so that you guys can have this conversation in a way that um, bonds you and really helps them understand what you've seen and been through as well. Take situations of racism and discrimination seriously and address them when they happen, particularly at home and school. I just want to hover on this, um, on this uh, concept for just a minute. In schools in particular, when things happen, whether it be that you know, uh, a child said something not very nice to another child, and they're young, so you don't think they know what they're saying, it can be really easy to kind of sweep it along by saying, oh, we don't talk like that. That's not very nice. Don't say things like that. The problem is that doesn't address the actual issue that's happening. It leaves the child who was discriminated against or insulted or offended feeling unprotected. And that can really lead to a situation where kids of color are feeling um, unsafe in their school setting. And it doesn't uh, use that moment as a teachable moment for the child who said whatever it is they said. So take the this, this situation seriously and use these, mo these um, moments to have very real conversations about uh, what was said or what happened. You also want to model and encourage equality and social justice. And we can do this across the board in a number of ways. First, and this is a really important point, we all do this. We all have both our own biases, our own understanding of the world around us. And without even noticing, we might be sending very specific messages to kids about different groups. So you want to be very mindful about the verbal and nonverbal messages that you may communicate to your children about different people and groups. I'll give you a really good example that people don't notice they often do. One of the ways that we start to send messaging to kids about how to group people based on race and ethnic um, grouping is that when we're telling a story, for example, we include the race or the ethnicity of the person when the person is a person of color. We leave that out when, we're, when the person is Caucasian. For example, I saw this guy on the subway today that XYZ. I saw this black man on the subway today that XYZ. In doing that, we immediately conjure up a grouping, some stereotypes, and some biases in what's about to come in the rest of the story. And when that happens over and over and over again, children start to group people according to the stereotypes and the information that they are starting to read from the way that you tell stories. That is a very 
small example, but it's a very powerful one. And it happens in any number of ways. You're walking through a certain neighborhood and you're holding your child's hand a little tighter. Somebody approaches you. If it's a person of the same background, you might be open. If it's a person of a different background, you might seem a little guarded. Those are all nonverbal messages that we send to kids um, about different people. And so you want to be very mindful how you're uh, communicating that. Participate in diverse social and educational experiences with your children, museums, um, uh, different festivals, etc., to really help them dive in and embrace the um, ethnic and racial differences and similarities um, across groups. Teach children to be the allies of people who are being marginalized or bullied. Talk to them about what they can do to stand up against injustice and discrimination and how to um, befriend uh, people who they feel are being marginalized or in school in particular are being bullied. You can also engage them in age-appropriate activities that focus on issues of inequality, racism, discrimination, and broader social issues. Um, and you want to make sure that those um, activities are age appropriate, but that you're really putting some meaning behind it, right? So you don't just go volunteer because it's time to volunteer. You go and you volunteer for a particular issue because it's something that you can talk passionately about and you can encourage your children to feel the same. And also talk to them about what they can and should do in the face of racism and discrimination. Who do they talk to? What can they say? How do they handle it? And more importantly than anything, how can they process it when they're the, the person on the receiving end? And last but not least, I want to um, you know, talk about um, the idea of colorblindness. You know, many times people will say, we don't see color. In our family, we just see human beings. You know, we're all the same. But unfortunately, this is not the message that we want to send. I myself am a Latina woman. I do not want you to exclude the fact that I'm Latina from how you understand me. And so teaching colorblindness really factors out an important part of who that person is, right? So we do see color. We do see differences. That's the way the world works. We want to help children understand those differences and embrace them instead of simply saying they don't exist. Really importantly, this also leads to a lack of a recognition of the systemic discrimination and bias faced by people of color. So by saying that we don't see color, it leaves off the fact that that person or those people's experiences is impacted by color and race and ethnicity. And so they, we do see the color, and their experience has been impacted by that. We don't want to leave that out of their story. It's their story. It also ends up, as I just mentioned, ignoring a very important aspect of someone's background, heritage and culture. And we don't want to leave that out. It's part of who they are. Instead, what you want to do is help your children understand that differences between people do exist, but that all people deserve to be treated fairly and with respect. So that bears repeating. We can highlight the differences. We can highlight the similarities. All in all, we want to help children understand that even though there are these differences, that all people deserve to be treated with respect and fairness. And last but not least, help them to recognize, understand, accept, embrace, and celebrate the very differences that we see, as well as the similarities. So don't focus on being colorblind, and don't focus on just the differences. Help them understand how we're similar and how we're different, and to really embrace those. And on that note, I would like to turn it over for some questions, um, and uh, we'll see what um, some of you would like to talk about. Okay, so the first question, how do you help uh, biracial and multiracial children understand racism and help them feel accepted by others um, as this comes with its unique prejudices? This is a really important question because, number one, for biracial or multiracial children, they are often focused uh, or experiencing uh, race racism and discrimination both outside of their cultural groups and within the cultural group, right? Because they're sort of uh, toggling and struggling between the, the different groups. Um, so the message is still the same, right? To really focus on their experience first and foremost. What is their experience? What have they seen? What have they heard? How do they think people treat them? How do they think people see them? So help them first process their own experience, and then begin to frame the conversation in the ways that I've discussed, that there are these differences, that there are similarities, um, and that they impact the experience of different children, and that we want to start bringing um, uh, people together and not to divide based on uh, race and color. Okay. 
So the next question is, what advice do you have for a white parent who is raising a black child? How can I talk to him about race when I might not be a credible messenger? Well, let me just start by saying, first and foremost, you are a credible messenger in many, many ways. Just because you don't have the same skin color that he does, doesn't mean that you can't talk to him very meaningfully about race and racism. What you can say is that because you have a different skin color as, as him or her, that um, your experience has been different and that there are some things that you haven't experienced that he has or will experience. So make it part of the conversation. It doesn't mean that you can't have the conversation though. The next question is, how can we best address racism, structural or interpersonal, discrimination, um, et cetera, taught or occurring in the classroom or schools? This is a really important issue because unfortunately, it's in schools um, where kids are uh, often most faced with um, separations and divisions based on um, color, ethnicity, and uh, racial uh, background. One of the first things that I can say is you have to take those situations very seriously and use them as opportunities to have a conversation not only with the students, but with the people, the other students who are uh, either perpetuating or um, doing things that are offensive. When you have those conversations, make it an open conversation. It shouldn't just be a discipline focused conversation. You said this or you did that, so you're suspended. Open the dialogue so that they can tell you how they're feeling, what's going on, and perhaps even process uh, their own emotions about um, the, the experiences. The next question is, how do I talk to my daughter, who's a five-year-old, who is already saying negative things based on someone's skin color or not liking her own features? This is really important. As I mentioned early uh, in this presentation, um, kids do notice. Um, very young kids will start to group people based on differences and similarities that they see. First and foremost, I want you to understand that that is the way that a child's brain works. They learn about their world by grouping things. They're starting to create what we call constructs or concepts. And then once they have the construct, they try to take um, new information and put it within that bucket, if you will. And so they're already doing it. So what you want to do first, stay calm. I don't know if your child is, um, if your child is Caucasian or a child of color, but doesn't matter. When you hear these um, comments, start first by reflecting what he or she just said. You know, it sounds like you're saying that you think that person is X because their skin is brown. Is that what you're saying? So have the conversation first by pointing that out and then ask them, well, what gives you that idea? And where, did you, where, do, where do you think you heard that? And what else do you think could be related to um, the reason that they're doing this? So, open the conversation, don't close it, okay? Next question, how can parents of color help guide their children with the right tools to interact with conversations on racism? For example, bullying in the classroom as a result of racism. First and foremost, you wanna make sure that you empower your child to tell, tell you, tell the teacher what's happening every time it happens. We definitely do not want children of color to just accept that this is their experience, which I, I think, unfortunately, in some scenarios, that's exactly what they just assume. It's kind of part of the context. We don't want them to feel like that's just the way it is. That's not the way it should be. And the whole point of a conversation like this one is we're trying to change that. So first and foremost, tell them what to do. Tell them who to tell every single time. And secondly, you can start to um, equip them with the um, skills they need to stay calm, but effective in communicating the way that they're feeling about whatever the person is saying. There are a number of programs um, across uh, the country at different universities and uh, online that are available for parents of color and for parents of uh, Caucasian children specific to talking about race and racism. And there's a ton of information on how to structure that conversation pinpointing exactly what to say, et cetera. So you might want to look into some of those. And um, next question, how can I discuss with a child of color who is temperamentally already somewhat anxious about racial tension and disparity? Well, let's take that as two parts. The first one is that they're temperamentally anxious. So that's a, a slightly different issue because they're likely going to be anxious about many things. And the second part is they're specifically anxious about racial tensions and disparities. Um, so the first thing that you want to highlight is that is that anxiety, right? So you can point out, I know that it makes you nervous when, 
I can see that you feel really anxious when you heard, um, those kinds of things. So you're pointing out the anxiety first. You're pointing out what's making them anxious, and then you're engaging them in a conversation about what they can do, how they can um, sort of calm the anxiety. And importantly, I sort of can't help myself as a clinical psychologist, if the anxiety persists, or it's really starting to impact your child's functioning, you definitely want to maybe have them work with somebody who can not only help them process how they're feeling, but help them manage anxiety as a whole, no matter what topic they're anxious about. How do you reassure your children that they're going to be okay when you have the those same doubts and fears for them? That's a really powerful and important question because I think we're all feeling anxious about not only what's happening right now, but what does this look like in the future? Is this going to be better? Is it going to be worse? So I know that it's creating some real anxieties for kids and adults. Um, and so there's nothing we can do about that piece of it, but there is something we can do about, um, you know, sort of reassuring that the best we can do is manage and address the situations as they happen. So what I mean to say by that is that reassuring them that everything's going to be fine and problem solving and just kind of like that doesn't usually lead to very many results because the child is still feeling the anxiety on the inside and so are you. The better thing to do is to focus on naming the anxiety. I'm feeling really anxious about what this looks like, my love. I'm feeling really nervous about X, Y, and Z. And there are some things that we can do to kind of stay calm and do the very best we can with the situation at hand. And that's true, again, no matter what the topic is. If you and your child are experiencing anxiety about anything, first name it, then problem solve it. But don't just brush it away because then it just sits. Okay? Next question. We've got some really good questions. I really appreciate you guys um, sending in these amazing questions. It really helps me um, know what, um, what's on your mind today. So this is our last question. Um, how should the child... Um, how old should the child be to start having these discussions? My five-year-old sometimes verbalizes things that show I need to do a better job with opening up about race conversations. How can I start? What advice do you have for parents of children of color to support or advocate them for, um, for them at school in light of our world today? So first part is start now. Uh, your five-year-old is asking questions or making comments. As I mentioned early, they really do notice these uh, differences from a very early age, so you can begin having these conversations right away, immediately after this webinar, if you will. Um, so one of the things that you can do is when you're noticing these comments and when um, your daughter uh, or son is asking um, different questions or making little statements, first reflect it. Huh, so it sounds like you're saying, and notice that it's a very neutral tone. So as soon as you infuse emotion into a response, kids recognize that they said something wrong or that you're upset. So even if you are horrified by what they just said, try to stay neutral, try to stay calm. It will make for a better and more meaningful conversation. Hmm. You know, it sounds like what you just said was X, Y, Z. Where did you get that idea from? So what do you mean by that? Engage, have the conversation, and then you can provide the counter message. That's actually not true, honey, because X, Y, Z, right? Um, so, and then how do you um, uh, advocate for them at school? If you think your child is being um, you know, marginalized or bullied or there's something happening in the classroom that can be educated upon, then I would go straight to the school and ask if they can do any kind of classroom uh, uh, message, any kind of ca classroom socialization. There are many programs related to teaching uh, race and racism uh, or issues of race and racism to young kids in classroom settings as well. So I would look into some of those. And with that, I will um, stop there. I uh, really just want to say thank you on behalf of the Child Study Center for joining me today. Uh, once you leave the webinar, you will receive a survey, and we would really appreciate if you would complete it. You'll also receive a follow-up email within a day or so uh, with a link to a recording of today's presentation. And we hope that you can join us for our next webinar with Winding Down from Summer, Tips for Transitioning Back to School by Megan Jorgensen. And that will take place on Tuesday, August 29th. Thank you again for joining me. And I hope that today's webinar has been uh, informative and helpful um, in making this uh, a better situation all around. Thank you.